I was asked to do this by the University Press. There hadn't been a new history of the state of South Carolina since the 1930s. And as I worked, a theme came out, and that was how do you deal with community, either those within the community or those who are left outside the community or on the margins. That's all part of the story. The book starts with prehistory. Depending upon the archaeological site, we can probably go back more than 10,000 years to Native American sites on the Savannah River. It's a little bit controversial. Were they really what we call Native Americans or were they something else? That has not yet been, been decided. But the Native Americans in, in South Carolina were interesting and a little bit different from others in that, yes, we had some major tribes. The Cherokee were in the mountains and the Catawbas were on the border with North Carolina. But in South Carolina, there were mostly extended families, 50, 60 people, which in terms of European settlement intruding into Native American territory made things a lot different from the Powhatan Confe Confederacy in, in uh, Virginia or King Philip's War in Massachusetts where you had very large Native American nations or tribes right at the settlement areas. Most of the rivers in South Carolina, if people ask me what were the names of the Native Americans, I say, look at the names of most of our rivers and they're named after Native American tribes. The earliest European settlers did not come directly from Europe. They were Anglo-Caribbean. They came from the English Caribbean islands, primarily Barbados. But anybody who came from one of the islands uh, was considered to be a Barbadian. That's what the locals called them. And for the first generation of European settlement, they were the majority of the white population. They came here with capital. They came here with slaves. They came here with used to running a colony on the frontier. And that's one reason South Carolina succeeded from the the get-go. And they just were not interested in having outside forces, in their case the Lord's proprietors who literally owned South Carolina, telling them what to do, particularly in the matter of economic affairs. And so in 1719 they had what's called the Revolution of 1719 and it's really the only honest-to-goodness overthrow of a government in the American colonies prior to 1776. And they tossed the proprietors out became a royal colony. In older histories, they refer to this as Secession I. Secession II would, of course, be the American Revolution. And, and South Carolina was involved in the revolution well before Lexington and Concord. Royal government here ceased in 1769, 1770 because of an internal dispute between our elected Commons House of Assembly and royal authority. The road to revolution was pretty much taken 1771, 72, 73, and actually blood was shed in South Carolina before the Declaration of Independence. This was the second state to adopt a state constitution in March 1776, before there was a Declaration of Independence. Then of course we come to Secession Three, which most people outside of South Carolina would recognize as the Civil War. Calculating the value of the Union, which South Carolinians began to do, white Carolinians began to do beginning in the 1820s. But there's also the question of how do you deal with a majority of the population who were enslaved? South Carolina had the largest enslaved population of any state in terms of percentage in the United States. By 1860, it was almost 60% of the population. And if slavery were abolished, as many in the North were calling for in the 1850s, what do you do with the population that's all of a sudden a majority? Do they get citizenship? Do they vote? What about economic competition for uh, the white working class? So there were a lot of issues involved, but South Carolina made a decision, sort of a snap decision in 1860, that if Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party came to power in the November 1860 elections, that they would leave the Union. It was not a, that was not a constitutional issue, that was a political issue. They said South Carolina and our way of life cannot endure in a union headed by the Republican Party and Abraham Lincoln of 1860. To talk about Ben Tillman on the campus of the University of South Carolina is interesting because he tried to close this institution down. He led a political revolution, a political faction to overthrow the old guard in South Carolina led by former Civil War heroes like Wade Hampton. His goal was to establish an agricultural college, which became Clemson College, and to shut down the other institutions of higher education in the state, which were the Citadel in Charleston, the Military College of South Carolina, and the South Carolina College, primarily because his political enemies, these were their strongholds. He also created the first state-supported black school in, the, in South Carolina, which became South Carolina State University. But the idea being that if we have a separate school, there's no way that they're going to be able to enter, that African Americans will be able to enter Clemson or 
South Carolina College, or now the Women's College in South Carolina, Winthrop. He was no longer governor, but he was still, he was a U.S. Senator and he was the power in, in the state. South Carolina since World War II has undergone a complete political transformation. It has gone from being one of the solid white democratic states in the, in the South to a predominantly, in fact, pretty much overwhelmingly Republican red state in the 21st century. That first began to occur, that breakup of the old democratic hegemony, or even domination, came when Strom Thurmond ran on the state's rights ticket in, in 1948. Because for the first time in almost a century, it was acceptable for a white person to vote for somebody other than a Democrat. Then in the 50s, you had Democrats for Eisenhower, and so the transformation began, and then in the 1960s, Strom Thurmond switches parties. Albert Watson, who was from a U.S. representative from the Columbia area, switched parties. The Republican Party begins to, to grow by leaps and bounds. The Voting Rights Act certainly helped spur the growth of the Democratic Party, allowing African Americans to be registered. And initially, for about 10 or 15 years, the Democratic Party was black and white legislators and, and party officials and what have you. But gradually, this state, the Republican Party, is overwhelmingly white. The Democratic Party is majority African American, although there are white Democrats in, in the state. And I guess the biggest change in term, in, other than party, is that from the early 1900s until about 10 years ago, South Carolina's politicians thought the best thing they could do for the state was bring home the bacon. Military bases, federal funding, what have you. Now, we have had in the past 10 or 15 years, members of Congress oppose projects in South Carolina, whether it's the port of, deepening the port of Charleston or highway funding. That would have been unheard of a generation ago. When I wrote the history, I wanted to tell the story of everyone, whether you're from the low country or whether you're from the Mill Hill in, in Spartanburg. And I didn't include people or events just to be politically correct. I think folks will find contradictions in South Carolina. It's a wonderful place. It's just who we are, and it's sort of a streak of independence. But a lot of it has to do with, again, my whole theme, and that is community.